here. Um, so the reason why your molar or your atomic masses are all these non quite not quite whole numbers is the existence of isotopes variant of these um, elements that have different from the average molar or atomic masses, excuse me. Um, and so mass spectroscopy can tell you in a given sample of an element uh, what kind of isotopes you're looking at and also the relative amount of them uh, compared to the others. So with hydrogen, you're probably gonna see a very large spike um, around the atomic mass of one, indicating that the vast majority of hydrogen atoms in a given sample all have a atomic mass of one. And then you might see some small spikes at other points that indicate that there are isotopes of hydrogen at other molar masses or other atomic masses, excuse me, that um, also exist within this sample just at much smaller amounts. And that explains why the sum average of them, of all those masses is gonna give you something slightly greater than one. Um, the same kind of goes for a lot of these other elements. So if I go to, I should have a mass spectroscopy. Whoop. So if I look at this first one here, you have an element X that has three isotopes, A, B, and C. So isotope A has a mass of 50 atomic mass units, and it represents 70% of the naturally occurring element X. Um, so obviously this one is going to be pretty dominant since it's 70%. Isotope B uh, has a mass of only 35 atomic mass units and represents 25% of the total of this element. And then isotope C has a mass of 70 atomic mass units and represents 5% of that element. So they want to know the atomic weight of this element that is going to be um, a fairly straightforward calculation of me. Whoa, okay. make the canvas a little bit bigger here. This one's relatively straightforward. Uh, I think you're sharing only the Chrome tab, so it's not it's not sharing the um, uh, paint if you're doing that. Okay, so I guess I have to share. Yeah, you have to share the whole screen. Okay, let me see if I can alter that real quick. Um, let's see. Share. Okay, let's see if this works now. Um, yep, we can see it. Cool, good stuff. Um, so, so for this, you're essentially just doing a. Let me make sure I'm phrasing this right. A a weighted average, essentially. Um, I don't know if you all have done that in any of your algebra courses or anything like that, but essentially how that works is you can just take your first mass value of 50, I might have highlighted a little too much there, and multiply that by 70%, or excuse me, the decimal version of points of 70%, 0.70, and you can add that to your second mass of 35, if I can type that properly, and multiply that by its associated percentage of 25% or 0.25, and add that to the final isotope mass of 70 multiplied by its percentage of 5% or 0 0.005. And the answer you're gonna get from that is, oh, I definitely did something wrong there, I apologize. Um, 59.7 plus 35, ah, there's a, okay. I definitely did plus there, sorry guys. 50 times 0.7 plus 35 times 0.25 plus 70 times 0 0.005 is 47.25. Okay, and indeed one of your answers is 47 and that is the correct one. And they basically do it the same way 
without explaining quite as much, but that's the math. Um, oops, let me go back to the paint. And um, let me see if I can explain this properly, but uh, if you kind of look at how these numbers line up, this will kind of explain, especially these percentages right here, right? So you have 0 0.70, 0 0.25, and 0 0.05. If you add them up, you see that they add up to exactly one. So these do represent the sum total of uh, the percentages or the percentage compositions of this element as far as all its different isotopes. These three make up 100% of the variations of this element. And so if you factor in their, each of the weights by their percentage, you can get the sum average or the weight of the average atomic weight of all of the isotopes. And that would be, that's kind of how the, these numbers are calculated here. And so let me jump back to the topics. Uh, I think your most of your mass spectroscopy. Well, let me see if I can find one that has a chart on it. Okay, masks. It might be one on one of these AP free responses. Though these are a little bit tougher. So let me. Ugh, me. Okay, here's one. So you have a mass spectrum of a pure sample of silicon, and you'll see that the vast majority of the of this uh, sample is all has the mass of 28. Um, it's probably a little bit over 90% based on the relative abundance scale on the side here. And then you have a couple that are 29 and 30. Um, this first question asks, how many protons and how many neutrons are in the nucleus of an atom of the most abundant isotope of silicon? So it is pretty clear um, from this chart that the most, abundant, the most abundant isotope of silicon is that of silicon 28, that, that the isotope of silicon which has the atomic mass of 28. Um, now, how do we know how many protons and neutrons are in there? Um, if we go to the periodic table, and I might have to rotate this again, silicon has a atomic number of 14. And remember that the atomic number tells you how many protons and how many electrons are in this element. Um, how you find the number of neutrons is you subtract the atomic number from the atomic mass. Since electrons generally have negligible mass and protons and neutrons each have essentially the same mass, um, then you will see that 28 minus 14 is 14. So you normally have 14 protons and 14 neutrons in a given sample of silicon or in a silicon atom, I'm, I apologize. In silicon atom, you should have 14 uh, protons and 14 neutrons. So going back to the question, They're asking how many protons and how many neutrons are in the nucleus of an atom of the most abundant isotope, that is silicon 28. Um, and based on what we know, the silicon has the atomic number 14. Then if you subtract 14 from 28, then you have 14 protons and 14 neutrons. So that's, an, I guess, an example of using an actual chart provided from mass spectroscopy to kind of determine a given set of data that you might need to use for the question. Um, ground state electron configuration is kind of another topic, so I'll save that for later. But just wanted to be able to show you all uh, what you all might see as far as a chart um, when they ask you about mass spectroscopy or tell you that this is what you're getting from a mass spectrum. This is kind of how you interpret that data. Okay, so. Jumping back here, elemental composition of pure substances. This kind of is tangentially related to what we just talked about. Let me go here. Ah, so empirical formulas are gonna be a big one, I guess. Um, 
So um, if y'all are familiar with empirical formulas or if you aren't, that is essentially a, I kind of think of it like you're simplifying a fraction. So y'all would know that two fourths or three sixths is just the equivalent of one half in the same way. Um, if I was to take the formula C2H4, well, the empirical version of this is just CH2. Um, note that the empirical formula doesn't necessarily represent what that compound actually looks like, but it's kind of just reduce, I shouldn't say reducing, it is simplifying the uh, individual numbers of each atom or each element, excuse me, within the compound down to their most, um, I guess their most simplified form. Um, if I was to take, and really this is mathematically just the same as, um, like I said before, you're simplifying fractions or um, say you're finding the least common denominator between uh, these elements. So if I have something like, if I have something really complex like C3H5O2 or something, then that's going to be its own that that is its empirical formula because you can't really simplify these numbers any farther down if that makes sense so um going back to here what we were talking about with the or with this question let me erase this real quick Okay, um, so this compound has 37.47% carbon, 12.61% hydrogen, and 49.92% oxygen by mass. Now, what is the empirical formula for this compound? Um, so you have to keep in mind that these are percentages by mass, but because each element has a, a different mass, then that's gonna, I guess that'll complicate things a little bit. So you can't just say, okay, it's 37% carbon, that means that I could treat it as if it was like C thirty seven H twelve and ox like uh, O forty nine and try and simplify it like that because that's not actually a reflection of the um, chemical composition of the compound. So instead, factoring into the fact that carbon is twelve times heavier than hydrogen. Oxygen is 16 times heavier than hydrogen. And we can get this by referencing the periodic table again. Let me, um, so oxygen being six weight, uh, atomic weight of 16, um, hydrogen being one, carbon being 12. Uh, if I go back to here. So I think the solution that they use here is probably a little bit more elegant than what I did. But um, I kind of made the realization that this is roughly three is roughly this about three times the uh, mass of carbon, which is twelve. So three times twelve is about thirty six, which is pretty close to this. And hydrogen being an atomic mass of one, this is about twelve times that. And then uh, oxygen being sixteen, this is about uh three times that as well so if i were to, if i were to go ahead and say c3 h12 o3 then that can be reduced to c h4 o so if basically essentially if you divide each of these numbers by three then this is what you get um and that's one of the answers. Turns out it is the correct one. The way they do it, and I will definitely show you all this for your benefit in case this makes more sense to you. Um, they converted it into moles and used a molar ratio. And I would say that's definitely a good way to do it like systematically as far as just being able to break it down and understand it. Um, you can literally take the, you can, Imagine that there's a hundred grams of this compound and break it, excuse me, hundred and break it down from there. So that would, that would come out to what? 37.47 grams, sorry. 
100 grams of compound would come out to 37.47 grams of carbon. Uh, oops. Uh, 12.61 grams of hydrogen and 49.92 grams of oxygen. Um, and they further, I guess if I was to multiply that by, I guess to find out how many moles there are, I'll do one mole over the molar mass, which is, 12.01, 12.01 grams. And this is essentially flipped. Uh, it's a reciprocal of the molar mass, which normally you would see 12.01 grams per mole. I'm just doing one mole per 12.01 grams. And grams being in the denominator here, we'll have to cancel out here and give you a resulting answer with the unit of moles. So. If I do 37.47 divided by 12.01, I get about 3.12. So it's 3.12 moles of carbon. And similarly here, if I multiply hydrogen by one mole over its mass of 1.008, then I get, oops, 12.61 divided by 1.008 is 12.6. Uh, excuse me, 12.5, what am I doing? 12.51, I guess, 12.51 moles of hydrogen. And finally, we do it for oxygen, oxygen being 16.00, and we get 49.92 divided by 16, you get 3.12, same as carbon, so, or same, number of as carbon, excuse me, same number of moles of carbon. Um, so you have 3.12, 12.51, and 3.12. And turns out if you divide all these by 3.12, 12.51 divided by 3.12, that's almost exactly four. And then these reduce to one. Let me... Four. Four H, excuse me, and one O. Oh. So in that way, you end up with C H four O, same as what I did, but mine was a lot less pretty. Um, so again, please chime in if you have any questions about any of that. Um, And if not, let me see how much more. Yeah, I think empirical formula stuff is covered pretty decently as part of these practice questions. So I'll leave that at that. Um, okay, composition of mixtures. Let me see if I can. I can drive this away real quick. Uh, ah, okay. So here with these mixtures, learning about homogeneity, um, I think they might ask you about like emulsions and things like that. Let me. See if I can just find a topic list on this real quick. Um, okay, so homogeneity um, and heterogeneity, uh, or homogeneous and heterogeneous, um, refers to composition uniformity. Um, a heterogeneous one is going to have distinct elements that, well, I should, distinct uh, components that are. Uh, visible. Uh, so I guess an example, I'll, they show here Rocky Road ice cream and salad. I kind of like to think of it as um, say like sand and sandy water or something. The sand is going to settle out of the water. Um, it's not going to remain a uniform mixture. Um, 
air is a decent example of a homogeneous mixture um, being made up of gases. You can't see the uh, different components that make them up. Um, like they say, you can, it's impossible to see the composition for us. Uh, salt water is also pretty good because salt will dissolve in the water. Um, I guess an exception is where the salt water gets oversaturated and the salt crystals start to uh, crystallize out of it. That's another topic that uh, you may run into as far as I'll need to brush up to get the exact terminology for that. But um, let me see if, I don't know if there are gonna to be topical things that they'll test you on as far as distillation and filtration. Uh, let me jump back to the examples real quick. So they ask, what is not a homogeneous mixture? You all might've seen the answer already as I scrolled up, but uh, no worries. Possible answers are coffee, oil and vinegar, tea, a table salt solution and wine. So if you think about them just one by one, um, yeah, you might see some coffee grounds in coffee, but for the most part, the liquid uh, form of coffee is all pretty uniform. Um, you're not gonna see a ton of stuff floating around in your coffee, hopefully, um, if you've done it right. Um, so that one should be pretty homogenous. Um, oil and vinegar, um, well, you know for sure oil and water don't mix very well. Um, so uh, certainly um, oil tends to not be homogenous with a lot of, uh, with some other liquids. Um, tea, same deal with coffee, right? Um, um, you might see some tea grounds or leaves or whatever, but the liquid itself should be pretty uniform. Uh, table salt solution uh, in water, salt, you know, water salt, uh, salt dissolves in water. So salt water is also pretty homogenous. Wine, same deal. Um, so correct answer is oil and vinegar, homogenous being uniform, that appears uniform throughout. Oil and vinegar is not going to mix very well, and is thus heterogeneous. Which is heterogeneous, all of the above, uh, I guess all of the below, whoops. Uh, oatmeal, chocolate chip cookie, um, gasoline, motor oil, orange juice with no pulp. Okay, so gasoline is pretty uniform, as is motor oil. Orange juice without its pulp is also pretty uniform. I actually want to say orange juice might be an emulsion, but that might not be relevant for the purposes of this question. Um, and obviously your oatmeal chocolate chip cookie is gonna be composed of a lot of different elements that are not blended very uniformly. So that's gonna be your answer here. Okay, mixtures. Um, which of the following are mixtures? Possible answers, all of the above, distilled water, topsoil, B and C. Okay, so clearly, uh, well, unless B and C refers to these two, Reese's peanut butter cup. Um, so distilled water is not going to be considered a mixture. That's a pretty uniform. Okay, actually, hang on. Let me, let me say B and C. Yeah, so as I suspected, their answers get a little mixed up. So B and C doesn't actually refer to the second and third choices. But yeah, distilled water is not a mixture. Um, it's liquid water and nothing else. Um, on top of the fact that it got distilled. So it's they filtrated out as many particles as they can out of that stuff. Um, so B and C probably refers here to topsoil and the Reese's butter peanut butter cup. So obviously your Reese's peanut butter cup contains chocolate and peanut butter. Um, and your topsoil can, can contain any number of uh, disparate elements. Um, so soil and other various like components that go into it. Um, will qualify as a mixture. Um, what differentiates a, um, a homogeneous mixture from a pure substance? Um, your possible answers are the composition of a pure substance is fixed. A mixture has a defined composition. A pure substance is always a compound while mixtures can be elements or compounds. A pure substance can be separated into elements by physical means and a homogeneous mixture is uniform throughout. Well, you know the last one is definitely true based on our definition of homogeneous or homogeneity before. Um, a pure substance can be separated into elements by physical means. 
this one I'm not so sure about. I I want to say it might take some more chem uh, chemical uh, I don't want to say techniques of uh, factors to split them up. Um, a pure substance is always a compound while mixtures can be elements or compounds. Pretty sure there are such things as pure substances that are like pure elements. Um, you'll, you'll hear that referred to a lot. A mixture has a defined composition. Uh, I feel like this defined is a kind of a loose uh, term. It's not very definite, ironically. Um, it's uh, and then a composition of a pure substance is fixed. So it turns out that is the answer. The, a heterogeneous mixture is a mixture of two or more components that do not appear uniform throughout. Pure substance contains only one component that has a fixed composition. Let me read that one more time, real quick. Um, a heterogeneous mixture is a mixture of two or more components. That do not appear uniform throughout. Yeah, that we know. A pure substance contains only one component that has a fixed composition. Well, just mixture. Don't know why they used a heterogeneous mixture to for a question asking about a homogeneous one. I'm wondering if maybe they meant to ask about a heterogeneous mixture. But I apologize for that probably lackluster example. Uh, okay. Let me jump back up here. Yeah, this is definitely more on the just not theoretical, uh, conceptual. Yeah, it's like conceptual. You're not going to be doing a whole lot of calculations um, or num or working with numbers as far as this. They're probably more going to test you on theory when it comes to mixtures. So a lot of definitions that you'll be working with, well, not a lot, but some definitions that you'll be working with there, uh, it's probably mostly gonna be vocab and an understanding of exactly what finds a mixture, knowing homogeneous versus heterogeneous. Um, I don't know, <laughs> excuse me. <laughs> I don't know if they'll test you on emulsions, but I'm just gonna jump to the article real quick because in case they do, I think, I think it, I definitely at least had to run across this term back when I did AP chemistry way too long ago. Um, so an emulsion refers to a mixture of two or more liquids that are normally immiscible, which is unmixable or unblendable, um, owing to a liquid-liquid phase separation. Uh, let me move this over so I can actually see this. Um, emulsions are a part of a more general class of two-phase systems of matter called colloids. Um, one substance consisting of microscopically dispersed insoluble particles is suspended throughout another substance. Um, I think a pretty good example of this is milk. Um, see if they actually, yeah, so, okay, emulsion or liquid crystal example, milk, mayonnaise, hand cream. So they have a lot of examples here. Um, pretty sure these kind of uh, fall within the middle ground between what is considered uh, homogeneous and what is considered heter heterogeneous. Um, obviously, a lot of details here that y'all will not have to know for the exam, but um, just understanding that there does exist kind of a middle ground, a gray area between hom homogeneity and heter heterogeneity, um, colloids and emulsions. Yeah, homogenized milk falls into their vinaigrette, interesting. Um, so yeah, I don't wanna dive too deep beyond what y'all would actually have to know there. So um, atomic structure and electron configuration. So okay, 
lovely atomic theory. Um, so the, the bare basics, obviously your protons have a mass of one, have a charge of plus one. Your nucleus, your nucleus, excuse me, your neutrons have a mass of one and a charge of zero. And your electrons have a mass of effectively zero and a charge of negative one. So those are your three subatomic particles and the foundation on which all of this is based. Mostly when it comes to, yeah, with, with AP chemistry, the big, uh, the big kicker is electron or electrons, um, knowing electron configuration um, is going to be quite important to y'all. So let me skip over this for the moment. Coulomb's law, yeah, y'all are going to run into this. Uh, this quantifies the electric force um, of attraction between two atoms and can be calculated using this equation, which you will have on your formula sheet. Um, that is Oh, they didn't include it on this one. Um, I really would be surprised if that formula does not get included on your sheet. Yeah, that kind of seems unlikely that they would ask you to memorize one formula while giving you all the others. But in any case, um, the force of electronic attraction or repulsion is given by Fe equals K Q1 Q2 over R squared, R squared being the distance between the centers of the atoms. So essentially one atomic radius plus the distance between the surfaces and the other atomic radius. Um, and Q1 is the charge on one atom, Q2 is the charge on the second, and K is Coulomb's constant. Um, which is 8.99 times 10 to the ninth Newton's mere squared over Coulomb squared. Um, oh boy, this one as well. Uh, jump back real quick. Yeah, you should not have to memorize this form. I'll just say that right now. Um, I might've missed it when I was looking at the form of the sheet. If so, I apologize. Um, Hmm. That is strange. Okay. So again, the magnitude of the charge, the greater the charge, the stronger the attraction. Um, and the closer the particles, the stronger attract the attraction. You can uh, see from the formula that that works because um, your your radius, or sorry, I shouldn't say your radius, the R distance between the uh, centers of the atoms is in the denominator. So the more you shrink this distance, the larger your overall force is gonna be. Like the smaller the de denominator, the greater the overall magnitude of your fraction. Um, And obviously if there's a greater charge between these two, then there's gonna be a greater uh, attractive force as well. Um, let's see. Uh, now I believe the force, if it, is, if it has a negative value is going to represent an attractive force. And if it has a positive value, it should represent a repulsive force. And uh, mathematically, you can see how that works because if both of them are positive, well, you know from even like magnetic theory and poles like there that uh, positives or that what opposites attract and like repel. So um, two positively charged atoms are gonna uh, repel away from each other. Um, two negatively charged atoms should also repel away from each other. Um, positive and negative will, of course, attract. So if Q1 here, 
if Q1 is positive and Q2 is negative, then your whole, your final force is going to be negative. Same deal if Q1 is positive, or excuse me, I said Q1 positive, Q2 negative. If Q1 is negative and Q2 is positive, then again, the whole thing's gonna be negative. So the force should be attractive. Um, if Q1 is negative, Q, or if both of them are negative, then your final force is gonna be positive and they repel from each other. If they're both positive, again, your final force is positive and they all repel from each other. Okay, the Bohr model. Um, this is a pretty decent visual representation, if not fully scientifically accurate as to how the electrons um, are arranged. This can help with the understanding of your valence shells um, or your electron shells and the valence one. Um, so sodium has 11 electrons. Um, two are in the first ring, eight are in the second, and up to eight can be stored in the third, but there's only one because two, eight, and then one is a total of 11. Um, that one valence electron in the outer shell um, is gonna be reactive with uh, anything that it can form a bond with, or uh, in the case of sodium, it's gonna form an ionic bond. And I wanna say in the loosest sense, it's donating its one extra electron to another, uh, it's ideally seeking to donate its one electron to another atom that it can, that, that will cause them to both become more stable when it donates its one electron. Um, the valence electrons or the outermost electrons have the most energy. Electron configuration. All right, here we go. This is where it gets a. Uh, more intensive, I guess. Uh, so your electron orbitals, um, the subshells are S, P, D, and F. Um, they can be seen in the periodic table itself uh, by different blocks that the tables can be broken up into. Your S block is gonna be the first two columns or groups. Um, and the S subshells hold only two electrons a piece. Uh, your P subshells hold six a piece. And as you can see, there are six columns uh, or six groups of the periodic table that um, correspond to the P subshell. Um, essentially atoms or excuse me, elements within these blocks will have their outermost layer of electrons uh, falling within these P uh, subshells. So for example, if I go here to say oxygen, oxygen is going to have its last layer of electrons essentially uh, the be four electrons within its uh, 2P subshell. And I say 2P because um, that corresponds to the, the second period um, it's, or the second row that oxygen resides in. So second row two, and then this being the P block, oxygen is gonna have two P four as it's as the final part of its electron configuration. So um, one S, um, helium is kind of that exception where even though it kind of sits on top of a bunch of P block elements, it is actually part of the S, the S or the one S block. So here, if I can kind of shrink this and make it work here. Uh, o can be represented by uh, 1s2. That represents the two electrons in the 1s subshell. Um, counting across, that's these two. And then 2s2 is gonna be these two right here, 2s2. And then finally, 2p4 is going to represent the final four electrons that lead up to where oxygen is in the table. So you can kind of count using the periodic table this way. If you just remember that the S blocks are here. Well, the S blocks normally are these two columns, but helium is part of that just because of the slightly odd arrangement of the periodic table in this regard. Um, and then you have, so 1s2, 
is here. 2s2 are these two. And then 2p block is are these six. And then oxygen is the fourth one there. So that is your electron configuration for oxygen. Um, the fact that oxygen does not have an entirely filled p block because the p block, the 2p block can go up to six and oxygen only has four. Those last two missing electrons are going to be the main factor in oxygen trying to bind with other elements in order to try and fill that p-block and become stable. Um, go back to here. Um, the d-block, the transition metals, um, this is where it gets kind of, I don't want to say ugly, but um, I think the d-block is probably the most, one of the more complex ones to work with. They go across, there's up to 10 of them. Uh, the counting method for these also gets kind of interesting. And I know I've got a Hans rule probably describes it a little bit. Um, electron configuration. So, <clears throat> So the order of filling orbitals is um, 1s, 2s, 2p, 3s, 3p. This is where it gets uh, a little weird. So you have 1s, 2s, 2p, 3s, 3p, 4s, and I don't want to say for whatever reason, but this is not the 4d block. This is actually the 3d block. So if I go back to wherever this was, here it is. I'm just gonna pull this over. Um, so you see uh, it's 3s, 3p, 4s, and instead of 4d, this is 3d, and then you go back to 4p, and then this is 5s, 4d, uh, 5p. I believe that's how it works. Maybe I should just place them side by side so I can actually see stuff. Okay, so 1s, 2s, 2p, 3s, 3p, uh, 4s, 3d, 4p, 5, uh, 5s, 4d, 5p. 6s, uh, and then they have the four, the f blocks down here as well. Um, the Larry on this is, I don't want to say strange. There's like a method to the madness, but um, if you look at the way these kind of stagger, it gives a little bit of insight into exactly how the that arrangement of, or the ordering of those blocks and in the order in which they're filled, how that works. So if you have one S, so if you essentially look at these rows, like the rows can kind of be laid out like one after another underneath each other like this, but the way in which they're filled kind of has this staggered staircase approach. So you go one S down to two S to two P, this is still a pretty linear order, two P to three S to three P to four S. Now the D blocks start appearing um, beyond the three, beyond the three period, I guess, excuse me. And then um, with the fourth uh, period and beyond, you start having the F block here. <coughs> uh, jump back here, actually back to here, four um, F, five F. Uh, all right, so electron configuration rules. Alpha principle um, states that you fill in electrons in order of increasing sublevel energies. Um, so that kind of dictates the order that we were talking about here. Um, Pauli exclusion principle states that no two electrons in the same suborbital orbital can have the same spin. Uh, if I go here to paint, I can kind of illustrate that a little bit because they probably have it on. Um, 
poly. Okay, here, control F. Perfect. Oh. Do they really not show a picture? That's really lame. That's okay. Let me draw it out real quick. Okay. So going back to here, if this is a suborbital, we'll just say uh, so 2p is probably a pretty good example because uh, the p uh, suborbital is going to have uh, three, gosh, are these going to be, or excuse me, 2p will have three suborbitals, each one able to contain up two electrons. Um, spin is often represented by arrows, which are pointing up or down. Um, you can think about spin relative to the word, the actual word spin by thinking of electrons spinning one way or the other, like counterclockwise or counterclockwise. Um, scientifically, that I'm not quite sure how much that holds water, but just think that they're essentially reversed to one another. Um, let's see if I can get an arrow. Uh, can I rotate this if I? Okay, probably not. That's I'll just draw it then. Um, Okay, so a filled orbital, okay, the arrow should be straight. I apologize that it's not quite straight. Um, a filled orbital would look like this, but um, your electrons don't fill the orbitals in that order. Like I'm not gonna have an up electron and then a down electron or a positive spin or negative spin, if you wanna call it that, um, fill one after the other like this. Instead, what's gonna happen is Instead, what's going to happen is your, we'll call the up arrow, the positive spin electron. And instead, your positive spin electron is going to fill the first, or it's going to um, occupy the first suborbital. And your second electron is going to be positive and fill the next orbital like this. And then your third one's going to fill it like this. And after that, they will begin filling the suborbitals with the opposite spin. So it's not one, two, three, four, five, six. It's one, or here, oh, let me mark it uh, with a color so that y'all can see that. So it's not one, two, three, four, five, six. Wow, that is ugly. Um, it's not this. It is instead. Um, Instead, one, two, three, four, five, six. So that is essentially the essence of the Pauli exclusion principle, saying that the electrons can't occupy, like you're not going to fill the same suborbital with two electrons while the other ones remain unoccupied. They're going to try and fill them one at a time. Um, if that's difficult for remem to remember, this analogy might help. Um, Hopefully it doesn't confuse y'all more, but this poly exclusion principle has also been compared to um, the concept of filling bus seats. Um, if you're getting on a bus, you're most likely gonna try and find an empty seat as opposed to sitting next to somebody first. Um, that is just what humans tend to do. So, I mean, okay, unless it's like your friend, but assuming it's all random people, you're gonna probably try and sit in an empty seat first. And in that sense, all the seats are gonna be filled by one person before the next person is essentially forced to sit next to someone else because there are no, no longer any open seats for them to sit in. Um, and so the electrons fill the orbitals in much the same way. Um, Hun's rule is, goes in with that. The say it states that the unpaired electrons must fill an unoccupied orbital before pairing. So I'm, I apologize, the Pauli exclusion principle is what dictates why you don't have same way facing electrons, like you don't have two up arrows in the same orbital. It's always one up, one down. Hun's rule is what determines that they fill them one, determines how they fill the orbitals uh, one at a time before the opposite 
sorry, Hund's rule is what determines, uh, it's essentially the bus seat rule. Uh, one electron is going to be in each suborbital before a second electron fills any of those, um, those singly occupied suborbitals. Oh, okay, English is hard. I apologize for that. Um, how do we write the electron configuration of an atom? Uh, I kind of did this earlier, uh, but we will do it again. So helium, helium only has two electrons and they fill the, uh, they fill the 1s suborbital perfectly. Um, hydrogen in turn would just be 1s1. Argon would be 1s1, no, excuse, no, excuse me, 1s2, 2s2, 2p6, 3s2, and 3p6. Does that kind of make sense how I'm interpreting that? Hopefully, yes. Um, Oh, this is probably good to know too. So there is a shortened way, an abbreviated way of writing electron configurations that essentially uses the nearest noble gas, the noble gases being the last column of, or the last group in the periodic table, group 18. Um, these are all noble gases, helium, neon, argon, krypton, xenon, radon. And this is new, I don't know this one. Um, but you can essentially use the noble gases to represent all the filled orbitals before that. So earlier I was talking about argon. If I go back to paint, instead of writing out all these orbitals, instead I can skip to the nearest noble gas to argon, which is neon, the preceding one. And I can write this, which will, the bracketed neon will cover 1s2, 2s2, and 2p6. So I no longer have to write any of that. And after that, I just write 3s, 3s2, 3p6, and that is argon. So hopefully that makes sense. Um, they're probably not gonna test you on knowing how to write that configuration, but they might have questions where they just use that configuration straight up. So it's good to understand uh, what you're looking at, right? You don't wanna be confused by that, that notation. And then, uh, so it's a good, <laughs> writing method to know. All right. Uh, here's a decent uh, example kind of showing what we were talking about earlier. So boron being 1s2, 2s2, 2p1, you're going to fill these orbital, the 1s2, or the 1s orbital first, the 2s orbital next, and the 2ps, you just have one electron in there. Um, here's a Good graphic showing what is correct, what is incorrect. When you're in the 2p2 orbital, if you have, or when you're in the 2p orbital, if you have two electrons there, it's going to be one and one. It's not going to be one and two together in the same suborbital. Again, they fill them one at a time uh, in one direction before they fill the rest or the same orbitals in the other direction. When I say direction, I'm referring to the electron spin, the up arrows versus the down arrows. Fe, all right. Here's a good last example that utilizes the D block. Um, I will brush up a little bit on F block things because as much as I want to say that you're not gonna encounter F block stuff on the AP exam, you can't be sure, right? So it's always good to know how that stuff works. But for starters, um, the D block, uh, iron, really common element that you're going to encounter in a lot of different things. So electron configuration of iron, 1s2, 2s2, 2s, uh, 2p6, 3s2, 3p6, 4s2, and then remember that this is not the 4d, this is the 3d block here. So you're going to be 3d1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6. So 3d6 is iron. So, yep. <laughs> They even say it here, but again, you know, I don't want to, I don't want to gamble on that. Even if they say it's unlikely, you're going to be asked to write an electric configuration of anything in the F block, still good to know. 
So, um, the F, yeah, I mean, the F block gets pretty far. The F block is essentially everything down here that gets, uh, uh, where the, uh, where the, um, uh, the elements in this block, they essentially belong in this space here. Obviously the periodic table pulls them out because otherwise you're gonna get this massive like offset here where all these get pushed out to the right by all of these. But essentially these belong in this section here and these represent the F block elements. Um, yeah, it gets a little bit nasty, I will not lie. Um, Okay, uh, let me jump out to the next topic real quick. Um, we've gotten to electron, electron configuration, photo electron spectroscopy. Okay, so. The formula that you're going to be using a lot when it comes to photoelectron spectroscopy. Well, here, let me cover the photoelectric effect first. Um, someone discovered at one point that when you shoot light um, onto a metal, it can eject an electron. Um, essentially, when the photon has enough energy and hits the surface, um, yeah, it can uh, emit an electron. and that is only if the frequency is high enough, frequency corresponding to the photon's energy. Um, when the frequency of light reaches a certain threshold, and that can be characterized by this formula right here, the energy of the photon is equal to Planck's constant H. At least I'm quite sure this is Planck's constant. Please don't let me be wrong about this. Uh, e equals H. I think that's a lowercase lambda. I need to brush up on my Greek letters. Where is this? Ah, here we go. Very beginning. So H Planck's constant is 6.626 times 10 to the negative 34th joules times seconds. And the thing that looks like a V but isn't is your frequency. So going back to here. Um, I guess they're going to cover the mathematics on that a little bit later. Uh, oh, that might be, I don't know if that takes place in kinetics, but oh, okay, here, yeah. Photoelectric effect is covered in more detail in intermolecular forces and properties a couple weeks from now. <clears throat> Okay, so don't worry about the math for this just yet. We'll get back to that later. Um, but understanding that the photoelectric effect is a result of light hitting a metal and popping out an electron. So, uh, ugh, binding energy. Um, Electron per okay. Let me all right. So photoelectron spectrum, this chart that you might see here showing a number of electrons on the y-axis and a change in energy on the uh, x-axis, uh, referred to as the binding energy apparently used very similarly to the ionization energy term, which we will cover not in this unit, thankfully. That's a can of worms in itself. Um, for now, think of it as the amount of energy required to remove an electron from the atom. Again, going back to what we were saying about the energy of the photon, hitting it enough or hard enough that it can pop out an electron. Um,
<coughs> excuse me. Um, so the wax just tells you how many electrons are in each peak and their binding energy. Let's see, uh, the peaks represent uh, the orbitals where the electrons are found. Um, Okay, so important ideas here. Position of the peak indicates how much energy is required to remove an electron from that sublevel, and the height of the peak indicates how many electrons occupy that sublevel. So a high binding energy should indicate, let me see, let me make sure I'm not misspeaking here. Um, okay, so the binding energy of electrons near the nucleus is gonna be the highest because the nucleus um, is attracting the electrons nearest to it most strongly. Um, and so in this case, what they're explaining here is that since this chart puts the energy level at the highest on the left, then your peaks closest to that high energy level are most likely corresponding to electrons nearest to the nucleus. Um, So the shell nearest to the nucleus is gonna be your 1s shell. So in this case, um, you can see that this peak being the closest or having the highest energy is almost certainly gonna be the one closest to the nucleus. And since it has two electrons in it, then that represents a filled 1s subshell, the very first one. Um, the next one here is most likely gonna be your 2s subshell. And that also is filled with as you can see, filled with two electrons here. The next one after 2s is going to be 2p and has two electrons in it. So that's going to be 2p2. It's not a filled 2p subshell because the 2p subshell has up to, can hold up to six. But that means your electron configuration for this is going to be 1s2, 2s2, uh, 2p2. Oh, and there it is. And if we go back to the periodic table, 1s2, 2s2, 2p2 is carbon, the sixth element. So kind of an important one. All right, so I'll do one more example here because I was kind of shaky on that last one. Um, here, looking at the binding energy, I don't even need to look at the question here, like uh, things that you can just tell from this right away. If you see the binding energy is really high here, then that means that anything that's closer to the left is gonna be have the strongest energy and is probably what's closest to the nucleus. Relative number of electrons, you can see here there's a peak at A. It doesn't even tell us how many electrons there are, but you can assume that because this one is the closest or has the highest energy, that this is gonna be your 1s shell. Um, the next one over is probably gonna be your 2s shell. And then the last one is going to be, or the last one shown here, but the next one over is your 2p shell. So if we assume that this is probably two electrons, well, it should be two electrons because you have other peaks rep representing other shells that have been fully or partially filled, which means that you probably have to fill this first one before you can get to the others. So that should represent a filled as 1s subshell, so 1s2. This should, should refer, this one should refer to a filled 2s subshell, so 2s2. And finally, the last one is a 2p subshell, which just based on its height, looks like it is probably a filled 2p, 2p subshell. So that would be 1s2, 2s2, 2p6. So again, they said it's neon. So if we just go here, we know that neon being a noble gas has filled subshells all the way. So 1s2, 2s2, 2p6. Um, which of the following statements best accounts for peak A being to the left of peaks B and C? Uh, choice A, the electron configuration of neon is 1s2, 2s2, 2p6. B, neon has eight electrons located in its valence shell. C, core electrons of an atom experience a much greater attraction to the nucleus than valence electrons. And D, peaks B and C show first ionization energies in neon where peak A shows the second ionization energy of neon. 
I want to say the answer is C. Going to what we were saying before, um, the binding energy is really high um, on the subshell that is, that is closest to the nucleus because the closest one will experience the strongest attraction to all those protons that are there. And turns out the answer is C. Woohoo! Um, core electrons of an atom experience a much greater attraction to the nucleus than the valence electrons. This goes back to the concept that the electrons closest to the nucleus have a higher ionization energy or binding energy, which is displayed here. All right. Um, that aside, let's go to periodic trends. These are definitely important to know. Um, Periodic trends. Okay. So your first trend is electronegativity. Um, electronegativity describes the atom's ability to attract and bind with electrons. So um, the easiest way to think about this, in my opinion, is that an electron, or excuse me, if you have only one electron missing in your outer shell as an atom, um, so for say chlorine, chlorine is only missing one electron before it becomes um, stable, as opposed to say phosphorus, which needs three more before it becomes stable. Chlorine only needs one. So because of that, chlorine is a lot more likely to attract one electron because that's all, it, that's all it's missing before it becomes stable. Phosphorus attracting one electron, not quite as strong because it needs not just one, it needs three before it becomes stable. So if phosphorus attracts two electrons then, and it only has one missing, essentially it's in the same spot as chlorine and then it can attract more strongly. But just thinking about the atoms in their ground states, so phosphorus is still missing three, it's not gonna attract an electron nearly as strongly as chlorine is because chlorine only needs one before it can become stable. So in that sense, we see that phosphorus is less electronegative than chlorine. So electronegativity appears to increase as you go from left to right. Um, as you can see with sodium, sodium cares a lot more about losing its one extra electron than gaining one random one. Um, so it's not very electronegative. Um, uh, as you go down, uh, let me see. Uh, yeah, as you go down, uh, the atoms, because they have more electrons essentially in their shells and the valence electrons are farther away from the nucleus, then they're not gonna be able to attract things as strongly because the nucleus with all of its positive charge is so far away from the exterior where all the electron interactions are taking place. So this concept of the nucleus's ability to attract electrons and whether or not that's hindered by there being a lot of electrons between it and the outermost shell is a pretty important concept that kind of um, that kind of helps to if you understand that you kind of understand a lot of the interactions that go on in these uh, periodic trends. So for electronegativity, a atom down here lower down with a higher atomic number and therefore way more uh, not just way more protons but way more electrons. Uh, will be will have a less strongly attractive force from those protons because of all the electrons that are kind of all the layers of electrons and subshells before you get to the outer part where the where you're, where the atom is trying to attract electrons to. Um, this is a concept that's known as electron shielding. So for all of you visual learners like me. Um, might be better illustrated if I go here and go ahead and say that this is the nucleus and I'll represent it using red. And there are protons and neutrons in here, but I will represent the electrons using yellow Well, hopefully, maybe orange. That might be a little better, more visible. Uh, 
and <clears throat> it's not very uniform. I apologize. Okay, so. Um, Oh, that was not my intention. Not cool. Uh, man, I really wish I could. Okay. All right. So this is an atom with a lot of electron shells. Uh, for now, to save me drawing like 30 electrons, uh, we'll just assume that all the inner shells are filled. And we'll say there's one electron in the outer shell. Um, now compare that to an atom that looks like this. And we'll say it also has an electron in its outer sheet. Oh boy, come on. All right, so you have two atoms looking like this. One is much larger than the other. If we say that all these inner shells are filled, um, oops. Well, I'll use blue. Okay, so if this shell is filled, this shell is filled, this shell is filled, and this shell is filled. Now, this electron here, this one, is not is going to be experiencing significantly less attraction due to its distance from the nucleus than this one. So this one's gonna experience a lot more. Uh, and this is a concept known as electron shielding. All of these shells effectively serve to shield this outer electron from the positive attractive force of the nucleus. And this effect, uh, is responsible for a lot of the trends you see in the periodic table, um, such as electronegative, such as electronegativity here. Um, like, uh, all right, I will take a hopefully brief moment to. Hold up. Okay. Okay, that was not my intent. Uh, come on. So even if this atom were to have what? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. So even if this atom were to have seven electrons and only need one more electron to, to fill its shell, this is not going to be nearly as impactful as this electron or this atom, excuse me, having seven electrons. Three, four, five, wait, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Yeah. And the reason for that is uh, an electron over here is going to, is much more likely to be attracted to that nucleus just because there's so much less distance for between it. Than this one because it's shielded by all these electron layers. Um, so again, that contributes to the whole electronegativity concept of this atom being much more able to attract an electron than this atom. So your smaller atoms up here that are also have like seven valence electrons are more likely to be highly electronegative than the atoms with a ton of electrons shielding their way to the surface um, and have a large uh, distance. So a lot of electrons shielding, creating distance that 
that, and also these having less valence electrons, right? Francium only having a single valence electron is not anywhere near to completing its shell. So you could say it's just not very motivated to get only one more electron. Getting one more electron is not very appealing. Like only one, right? Getting only one more electron is not very appealing to a francium atom. Okay, that long-winded explanation fortunately also helps us to explain, uh, let me skip ionization energy and come back to it. Um, electron affinity is the ability of an atom to accept an electron. You could almost say it's how much an atom wants an electron. Electron affinity, affinity meaning, I think of it as like getting along with something, but um, uh, they, it, share, it is essentially the same directional trend as, electro, uh, as uh, electronegativity, but the concepts are not quite the same. So electron affinity is a quantitative measurement um, so it has a number associated with it of uh, the energy change that occurs when an electron is added to a neutral gas atom. So uh, the more negative the electron affinity value, the higher the atom's affinity for electrons. Um, now, I believe this is due to the energy change being negative because uh, an, an atom should release some energy when it goes to a more stable state. So essentially, again, same with electronegativity. These atoms have a much higher electron affinity, um, which is represented by a, a larger magnitude negative number, uh, kind of reflecting the energy that they will release as they go to a more stable state if they get one more electron. Um, Going down again, we'll say francium is our extreme example. Francium is not very does not have a high electron affinity because it's just not motivated to get only one extra electron. Um, not to mention, it uh, is a large atom with a ton of layers of electrons between the nucleus and the outside, so it's just less likely to attract an electron. Okay, um, atomic radius. This is the opposite. Um, these are literally how big are the atoms. Um, and francium is huge. Francium has uh, a large atomic radius because of all of its uh, all of its uh, layers of electrons. And let's see. Um, See the nucleus. Okay. Um, looking at this explanation, it it all again goes back to the nucleus attracting the electrons towards it. So francium having that one extra valence electron on the outside, uh, essentially it added a it added. It added one extra shell with only one atom in it. That was not, sorry, come on. Francium adds one extra shell with only one electron in it. Um, here we go. But it has all these other layers under it. Um, The, the reason why uh, the atoms or the elements that follow francium are smaller than it are because even as it is uh, adding more electrons to its outer shell, it is also adding, when I say adding, sorry, as you go up element by element, as uh, even as they gain, as they have extra electrons as part of their outer valence shells, they also have extra protons in their nucleus. And those extra protons serve to essentially contract and pull the different electron, all the ele electron shells of that atom closer together. So um, from francium, uh, even as you get more electrons 
and you might think the atom might get bigger, it'll actually get smaller because the protons will attract it a little bit more and shrink it just that by that by just that much more. Okay. Um, the melting point trends are not super consistent. Increasing metallic character. Um, the alkali metals, the leftmost column, are the most uh, metallic, and they are also known as some of the most reactive elements. Uh, a lot of these guys can explode or catch fire just in the presence of oxygen. Some of them catch fire when they get thrown into water. It's, there are some pretty wild behavior from these, like lithium, uh, cesium, francium. Um, and as it turns out, these are the most metallic. Uh, I want to say that you can, yeah, you can define metallic character as how much an atom wants to lose a single electron. So in contrast to what we were saying earlier about all these atoms on the far right, really wanting to gain one electron, these are the polar opposite. These want to lose one electron because one electron lost is going to make them more stable. So lithium, sodium, potassium, rubidium, cesium, francium are all really wanting to lose one electron because that'll essentially turn them into a noble gas configuration, not into an actual noble gas, but it'll give them a stable configuration of their electrons. So uh, again, the opposite of electronegativity, electron affinity, where all those want to gain an electron, these guys want to lose one electron. And that's uh, characterized by this description or by this concept of metallic character. Okay. Um, I did skip over ionization energy, so let's go back here. Uh, ionization energy is the energy required to remove an electron from a neutral atom in its gaseous phase. The idea of turning it into a cation. Um, quick review, I was looking at this earlier and I realized that um, hopefully y'all are familiar with cations and anions, but if not, one way that I used to, or that I was taught to remember what refers to a positive and what refers to a negative is, um, with cations and anions, cat has the letter T in it, and lowercase t kind of looks like a plus sign, especially if you don't write the little hook on the end like a serif font. So if you just write your, t your little t like a plus sign, then you'll know that the cation is the positive ion and the anion is the negative one. So just a quick little tidbit. Um, so ionization energy, you're trying to turn an adon, you're trying to turn an atom into a cation, into a positive ion by removing a single electron. So the higher this energy is, the more unlikely it is that the atom that the atom becomes a cation. Um, again, uh, the guys on the right have really high ionization energies because they don't want to lose a single electron; they want to gain an electron. So the ionization energy representing, I guess, the amount of energy that you need to to pull an electron away. Well, you're going to need a lot of energy to pull an electron away from these guys because they really want an extra electron. They don't want to lose one. And here, you hardly have to expend any energy to pull an electron away because that's exactly what these elements want. They want to lose an electron to become more stable. So hopefully that makes sense. And I, that should cover all of the, period, the major periodic trends, electron affinity, ionization energy, electronegativity, all increase from bottom left to top right. And then your atomic radius and your metallic character will increase from top right to bottom left. That's a lot, I know. So it's definitely not something I picked up in a day back when I learned it. So feel free to ask questions again. Um, but if not in Zoom, y'all can also email me or whatever. Um, so going back to here, sorry, going back to here, topics. Well, we've covered periodic trends. Covered pretty much everything except for valence electrons and ionic compounds. So uh, we well we've already talked about valence electrons a, a decent bit. Um, that's referring to the outermost shell of electrons, um, which kind of determines the character of that element entirely, uh, or in a lot of ways. So like we said here, these alkali metals um, only having one valence electron, they really want to lose it to become stable. These guys in the uh, Oh goodness, the halogens, yeah, the halogen column, uh, group 17. These guys all really wanna gain one electron so that they, be they can become stable. Um, 
And these guys all have, not all of them, but fluorine and chlorine, for example, have seven valence electrons in the second orbital uh, or the second electron shell. And so one more is gonna get them to eight. That's the stable number. Uh, lithium has three. It drops one and then it goes to two, the stable number. Sodium has 11. It drops one and goes to 10, the stable number. Um, jump back to ionic compounds. Valence. Yeah, valence electrons are the outermost electrons in the atom found in the S and P orbitals of the outermost shell. Um, oh, interesting. A gap in ionization energies could tell us how many valence electrons an element has. And elements in the same group on the periodic table have the same number of valence electrons. This is a good one to know. Um, I didn't really highlight it, so my fault, but this is a good kind of relationship that you should know when looking at the periodic table. Anything in a given group always has the same amount, and groups being the columns, always has the same amount of uh, valence electrons. Uh, in case you're having trouble with uh, distinguishing between groups and periods, periods being the rows, groups being the columns, um, one way you can think about it, unfortunately, this might not apply to everyone depending on which high school you go to, but if you went to high school in Plano, um, you probably have seven periods in class periods in one day. So uh, as you can see here, the primary on the periodic table has seven rows, seven periods. So We can't hear you. You're muted.
Okay. Can you all hear me? I'm plugged back in my computer, so I don't know how reliable this is going to be, but uh, we're pretty much at the end, so hopefully we can get through the end of this relatively smoothly. Um, okay, so again, uh, metals are good conductors of heat, if, which you'll know if you've ever touched anything metal that's been sitting in a hot environment, that hurts. Electricity as well, beware of metal around outlets, right? Um, shock hazards. Um, shiny, pretty common knowledge. Malleable, okay, it depends on the metal, but um, yeah, some metals are pretty bendy. Uh, aluminum is, well, I guess aluminum, yeah, aluminum is right on the edge of the metalloid staircase, but um, aluminum is super malleable. You can, like, you know, aluminum foil, um, even like sheets of aluminum. You'll see them bend as you pick them up if they're thin enough. Um, ductility refers to the ability to pull a metal into wires. Um, I really doubt you'll get a conceptual question on ductility, but just in case you do, uh, just think of it as being able to pull something into wires. And we all know how commonly metals are used in wires. Um, Nonmetals are the complete opposite. Uh, they are bad conductors of heat and electricity, and they're brittle. Uh, they don't bend very well. Um, if you think of something like carbon, right? Like coal, charcoal. Charcoal doesn't bend very well. It breaks into little pieces. Um, uh, but nonmetals can be used as insulators um, because they're specifically because they're not great conductors of heat and electricity. And then metalloids, uh, like we said before, or, or I don't know if you heard me when I was talking about it, but metalloids have properties of both metals and nonmetals, and Okay, no worries. Yeah, sorry for all the technical difficulties earlier. Um, are we good if uh, I can provide like my email or anything? Or uh, if y'all want to shoot individual questions at me? Um, and I will also send out a Google Doc with some practice problems, um, which I'm not quite done making, but I will send that to you all so that you can have something to mess with during the week. Um, it may or may not contain some of the examples I worked on, but it should also contain plenty of ones that y'all haven't seen yet. So um, just something for y'all to look at if you want extra practice. And if you have any questions on them, you can also throw those my way as well. So. I can go ahead and maybe put my email in the chat and also copy that down. And then uh, we can work from there. Uh, for the Google Doc link, um, where would be best for 